It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the ASUS PA32DC. As usual, there's a full written review, which this video review accompanies. You can find a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. You can also support us by liking the video, and if you haven't already, subscribing to the channel. This video review won't go into the same kind of technical detail as the written review does. It won't cover all of the areas that the written review does either. It's really just designed to give some nice examples. They're mainly in-game examples. Obviously this isn't a gaming monitor, but games still give some interesting scenarios which can be used to help explain certain performance characteristics for the monitor. Also be aware that this little thing at the top there, I don't know why I'm moving my mouse as if it's going to move on to it, but just at the top of the screen, the little internal calibrator, that isn't going to be shown off in this video either. There's actually a separate video looking at the ProArt software, the ProArt calibration software, which is used to control this. And there's a link to that in the description of the video as well. Also be aware that what you see on the video depends on my camera, it depends on the processing done by my video editing software, it depends on the processing done by YouTube, and ultimately, and very importantly, depends on the screen that you're viewing the video on. So in no way does it accurately represent what the monitor would look like in person. This monitor uses a 32 inch OLED panel, an RGB OLED panel, true RGB. So it doesn't have any particular issues with the sub pixels, no fringing to worry about that kind of thing. Just regular RGB stripe, nothing weird going on there. It has a 3840 by 2160, that's 4K UHD resolution and it supports a 60 hertz refresh rate. So this screen size and resolution combination, I personally really like it. It's something which, having spoken to people about it before, communicated with them about it before, they usually find it something of a sweet spot for the resolution. So I can use it without any scaling, but I also find 125% scaling perhaps a good fallback. It really just depends on your own personal preferences, your eyesight, how far away from the screen you're sitting, just how you want things to look really. So if you want to use scaling, that's fine, you can. If you don't use scaling, you get a huge amount of desktop real estate. As you can see here, all of this text is very crisp. It's very clear, nice and small. And again, it might be too small for some people. So if you do want to use scaling or application specific zoom to make it larger, that doesn't mean that the text suddenly becomes blurry, or it shouldn't with most applications on Windows. It actually scales cleanly, which means that it does become bigger but you still benefit from the high pixel density. So you still get that crispness, that clarity as well. Same applies to high resolution image content, games and movies, as well as just on the desktop. It has a certain clarity, which is missing from monitors with a significantly lower pixel density, such as 27 inch WQHD 2560 by 1440 models. I need to just quickly talk about image retention or burn-in because that is of course a concern for OLED monitors. I reviewed this over a period of about three weeks. I'm afraid I can't give you an idea of what to expect longer term with this monitor, but what I can say is I didn't have any issues during my review period. I used it normally. I didn't take any particular precautions. The monitor has some integrated precautions. So one of the things that has this sort of active area around the image where there's a black border and the image will shift a little bit within that border. It doesn't eat into the pixels of the screen or anything like that. It's in addition, it's around the image between the little sliver of black panel border and the image itself. And as explored in the OSD video, there's a proximity sensor and screen protection feature, and you can enable both of those or one of those. And what that means is when the monitor isn't being used, it will dim significantly. If you're already using a low brightness level, then congratulations, it won't need to dim. But if you're using a fairly normal brightness level, say 100 to 200 nits, then it will dim below that when you're not using it. So that can just help with the longevity of things and reduce your chance of image retention or burn-in. But again, as I said, I can't report on this longer term. I've only used this monitor and only will use this monitor for a relatively short period of time. From the front, you can see that the monitor means business. It's got a fairly chunky design, no slender dual stage bezels or anything like that, just a normal single stage bezel covering almost the entire panel border. There's a little sliver of panel border you can just about see, a little sliver of black on the inner edge. You've got the OSD controls there, lots of buttons. That's all explored in the OSD video. Also explored in the OSD video is that, which is a proximity sensor, which just dims the screen if nobody's using it. It's a dedicated power button as well, and a little joystick also for the OSD control. Other than that, matte black plastic or sort of a satin finish black plastic or brushed effect black plastic for the bottom bezel and the stand neck. Shiny silver colored 
ASUS logo in the middle there. You can see it here in its mini stand configuration. So it includes these little stand feet, which you can use instead of the main stand. You don't get any adjustability this way, but it does make it more compact. And some measurements are given in the written review in the features and aesthetics section for how high it would be, how much clearance you've got against the desk and the full depth of the monitor, that kind of thing. The top there, you've got the motorized colorimeter. And just to remind you, that's explored in a separate video, which is linked to in the description of this one. And that also looks at the ProArt software more generally which is used for the hardware calibration function of the monitor. Now, swiftly move on to the screen surface, because you'll be able to see here, it has, well, I'd say it has reasonable glare handling. It's not the same as a glossy screen surface or certainly an untreated glossy screen surface. It's what I'd classify as a very light matte, or some would call it semi-glossy. This is a moderately bright room, so you can see some sharper glare, some reflections, a sort of glassy look. You don't get the sharp reflections you'd get on a glossy screen surface but you definitely do get some reflection. So yeah, not the best glare handling from this one. You might also notice there's a sort of blue tint to the image, the reflection, any sort of reflection of light, the reflection of the light wall behind me that actually has a bit of a blue quality to it. And I was showing you before the panel border, that's actually pure black. So I think this is again, like I saw on the QD OLED, the Alienware, the lack of the outer polarizer on OLED screens like this, it means that the screen doesn't just look pure black when it's switched off or when it's displaying pure black either, if there's light in the room. Now remember this is a moderately bright room, so if you are using this in a darker room, dimmer room, you don't have this issue, but it certainly is worth being aware of this. And I'll reference this again in the contrast section where it's certainly relevant when I get there. The monitor includes a shading hood and it's quite easy to attach, although it does take a little bit of fiddling. So there are these little sort of rubber plugs at the top of the monitor and also at the rear and you need to take them out and then that reveals screw holes and then you just screw the side elements of the hood in. They actually have little screws attached to them already and then you get a packet of screws for the top bit of the hood and then you can screw that in or you can just do what I do because I'm going to detach this shortly and just have it not screwed in at the top. That's fine, it still just sits there, no problem. There's also a little flap here and that will just come up when the colorimeter moves so it doesn't impede the integrated colorimeter. It also has a little hole there, which allows it to be used as a light sensor, the integrated colorimeter. It's explored in the OSD video, so it can be used as a light sensor to look at the ambient light and make some adjustments based on that, if you want it to. Just run the colorimeters in its idle position. In terms of the effectiveness of the anti-glare hood, well, it really does what anti-glare hoods usually do. So it will prevent some of the light coming from the sides, sort of at a sharp angle or above as well, but it isn't going to stop light that's behind you or more behind you and to the side, but also a bit behind you, striking the screen surface. You can certainly still see a fair bit of glare. Again, this is a moderately bright room. So just because you've got an anti-glare hood, don't think you can just do what you want with your lighting environment. You still want to be careful with that. And just another quick thing to mention is that the inside of the hood has a nice velvety texture, so it's nice and soft. Just thought I'd mention that. I'm just going to show you a quick comparison of this screen surface and another. This is just a picture taken from the written review showing this monitor beside a Gigabyte Aorus FI27QX. So the FI27QX is switched off. This monitor is displaying black, so it's the same as if it's switched off. Just so you can compare the screen surface. And it's in a moderately bright room. The screen surface of the Gigabyte Aorus FI27QX is what I classify as light to very light matte. But you can certainly see the difference in glare handling and also this has a sort of blue tint, whereas the Gigabyte Aorus is just sort of the traditional black or slightly greyish tint. Turning the attention to the rear now, you can see I have the mega stand, sorry, the regular stand, the non-mini stand attached. So that offers full ergonomic flexibility. You can see the exact adjustments in the written review in the features and aesthetics section, but that means you can adjust the height, you can tilt it, swivel it, and pivot it 90 degrees into portrait. And those adjustments are all nice and smooth, particularly the height adjustment, that's satisfyingly smooth. Although this looks like it could be brushed metal, it's actually plastic. Uh, the only sort of real metal element at the rear, aside from those little screws, is this bit at the top, little carrying handle, which allows you, especially if you're using the mini configuration, extra portability. It's nice that even with such a large monitor, they've thought of the portability aspect, which is useful for some people if you need to move it from room to room or move it about a lot. There's an all-important Kensington lock slot, which I always find difficult to say. I should really just say K slot. It's a lot easier to say. There's a K slot there. If you don't know what that is, you probably don't need to know what that is. There's a cable tidy loop, quite a small one actually, not particularly large, 
It's just there. And again, it's plastic. It's not metal or anything like that. And although I keep saying the stand's plasticky, I know I'm kind of a fan of premium feeling metal stands, but this one's actually really quite heavy, quite hefty. It's got good weight to it. It's got some metal plates inside it. So it certainly doesn't feel cheap or anything like that. And you'd hope not because this monitor isn't cheap at all. The ports of the monitor, they're actually at the sides because if you're using this in the mini stand, the bottom of the monitor is going to be very low down. So for accessibility, they've included side mounted ports. So at the left side is viewed from the rear, you can see the power. So that's an AC power input with a zero watt power switch. So that means it has an internal power converter, no power bricks or anything like that. And you've got three HDMI 2.0 ports and display port 1.4. You've also got a little 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. In terms of the capabilities, the monitor supports 60 Hertz, has HDR support, 3840 by 2160. You can get all of that by HDMI or display port. Thing is though, this is a true 10-bit monitor. If you're using HDMI, you're limited to 8 bits at 60 hertz, unless you're running under HDR, but then the 10-bit that you select, you don't actually select it, but it will be using 10-bit processing, but that will be using GPU dithering. As I explore in other reviews, it actually works very well, and I sort of briefly mention it in the HDR section. But if you want true 10-bit color, and certainly if you want to be using a 10-bit signal for SDR at all, then you need to be using DisplayPort. The right side, as viewed from the rear, there's USB-C at the top there, and that supports 65 watts power delivery, supports USB upstream and DisplayPort alt mode, and you've got four USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports. And I was going to say last but not least, I think probably is least actually in my opinion, the downfiring speakers. It has two integrated 3 watt speakers. Don't think that because you're playing a lot from a monitor that your speakers, if it has them, are going to be particularly good. They really aren't in this case. The volume's pretty limited. The quality's not particularly good. They're there if you need to use them, but they're not going to replace even a half decent set of standalone speakers or headphones. I'm just going to show you the on cycling process of the monitor because it does take a while. I'd feel a little bit guilty if I didn't mention this. Turned it off now. Just turned it on. Takes a while. Displays the ASUS logo. Black screen for a bit. And you can hear that strange sound. Yep, does that for a few seconds. It seems to be like the motorized colorimeter sort of, I mean, it doesn't move, but it seems to be sort of prepping itself for some kind of action, which is a bit odd. And it is pretty loud, actually. Just thought I'd share that with you. I'm now on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and I'm going to talk about the contrast performance of the monitor. So this monitor has an OLED panel. Contrast is its main strength. Usually I say it's not its main strength, so I'm talking about IPS type panels, but this, in this case, definitely is. Has a essentially infinite contrast because it doesn't have a backlight per pixel illumination. It can shut off its pixels entirely when it's displaying black. So remember that as usual, I'm in a dark room here or a dimly lit room. That's how I like to start my videos when I'm talking about contrast. And these are really the conditions under which OLEDs thrive. It doesn't have to be completely pitch black, but the edge compared to your LCDs really is very apparent in a dimly lit room. So even as I zoom in here, lots of shadow details there, darker areas. If I was looking at this on an LCD, the depth of those dark shades would be much less impressive. It would also usually be glow of some description, IPS glow or perhaps VA glow, which would lighten it up peripherally. But here it's completely uniform, completely dark. It also gives better structure to things, so the details in the rocks, the little cracks and other little dark texture details, because they're so deep and the brighter shades contrast with them so well, it definitely helps give them a more defined look. People often just think of dark shades when they're thinking of strong contrast on an OLED as well, but it's not just that. Actually, if you look at the medium shades, LCDs by comparison, they have a kind of leaky quality. It happens a bit less with the VAs, but they have other issues which can affect the representation of things. But with OLED, everything's completely consistent. You know, there's, there's perfect gamma consistency across the entire screen. You don't get these shifts in sort of dark detail level across the screen or different points of the screen. And also if you consider medium shades, there are plenty of those on this wall here, for example. On LCDs, there's often a kind of translucent quality to them, there's sort of a little bit of a leaky look to them, whereas they look really kind of solid and inky on OLEDs like this. So that's really nice as well.
The brightness capabilities of OLED, you know, it doesn't get as bright as some LCDs, but this one goes up to, I measured 264 nits of brightness maximum without any sort of ABL or automatic brightness limiter coming into play. There's a setting called uniform brightness on this model. Enable that most of the time. Most people will just want to keep that enabled if you want it to be able to go brighter, but it will depend on the content. You can get it up to 541 nits. That's what I measured without that enabled, but it will depend on the content. And as bright shades start to dominate, it will dip in brightness, so it won't always reach that. And these shifts in brightness can be pretty annoying, especially if you're on the desktop, but I notice them in games and movies. And anyway, for most people, you're going to be wanting to set your monitor somewhere around 100 to 200 nits anyway, and you can get that range without using any ABL on this model. As usual, further details on the written review in the contrast table there. I've now brightened the room up. It's moderately bright, it's not extremely bright, but even so, as I mentioned before, this monitor has a very light matte anti-glare screen surface, which some would call semi-glossy. Glare handling isn't incredible on it. Hello, you can see glare there. And you can also see that the depth of the dark shades is raised. If you remember how I was showing you what the screen looked like when it was switched off, well, that's what blacks look like on this as well. Very dark shades also lightened up. So you can definitely see plenty of glare and you, you can't really appreciate the edge and contrast that the OLED provides here. I mean, yes, technically in this lighting, you may be able to sometimes see a bit of IPS glow and that kind of thing. But you know, in my videos, usually I lighten the room up and say how it's beneficial because it you know, makes the weaknesses and contrast less apparent. It's really the reverse with OLED screens like this. As you brighten things up, the edge and contrast compared to LCDs just vanishes, certainly in terms of the dark shade, but you still get that excellent gamma consistency. Um, there's again, kind of a solidity to these medium shades, which you can appreciate. And in terms of the brighter shades, this screen surface, just because it's very light or semi-glossy, it doesn't mean that it has a completely smooth finish to it. There's actually a little bit of graininess, sort of a bit of misty graininess. It's not too bad. It's not a sort of really heavy graininess but it is something which I'm sensitive to and I do notice it myself. But there isn't a layered appearance in front of the image, so it gives fairly direct emission of light. I'm now on Legom, legom.nl, the website, and the test for viewing angles. I'm gonna start talking about color reproduction. I like to start off talking about color consistency, viewing angle performance a bit here. Mainly color consistency or viewing angles from sort of a regular viewing position in front of the monitor at a desk. So the Legom text test, really good blended gray throughout. There is a bit of a red tint to the striping or pink tint to the striping at the extreme side edges of the screen. And there's also a bit of a pink tint to the background shade as well. And this is something which you can see even more clearly if you're looking at white on this monitor. So you'll see that on the desktop quite a bit. This isn't a uniformity issue per se. It's actually is related to the viewing angles. You'll see in the viewing angles video when I show the Legom text test, it sort of shifts between a blue tint to the image and a pink tint to the image, depending on viewing angle. From a normal viewing position, it's just that you really see a bit of a pink tint towards the corners of the screen or the side edges of the screen. It's a bit odd, but it's something which apparently is characteristic of certain OLED models. And with LCDs, you, you tend to get these kind of shifts anyway, just naturally at various points of the screen. It's just with OLEDs, everything in general is very consistent, except there are some shades, lighter shades, where you can see this pink tint in places. But for most content, most shades, there's really excellent consistency, not this issue. The purple block here also shows that sort of variable pink tint, um, and certain shades of purple will show this. This isn't represented very well at all in the video, I have to say, so I'm just going to have to talk you through it but it's mainly a sort of pinkish purple throughout the screen. It's just that there is a stronger pink tint towards the side edges again. It's related to viewing angles. And if you shift, and in fact, I'll just shift the camera now a bit, you might be able to see that sort of shift around. It won't show you exactly what it looks like. It almost seems to invert it on the camera for some reason. It looks like there's a pink ball in the middle and it's purple elsewhere. That's not actually what it looks like. It's quite the opposite, very odd. But anyway, you can see that there are shifts when I move the camera around. But yes, for most shades, not a problem. So this red block is a nice vibrant red throughout, really consistent, rich red throughout the entire screen. Same with the green, yellowish green chartreuse shade throughout the screen. And royal blue, as usual, royal blue throughout the screen. And I should have mentioned as well, even with IPS models, you sometimes get some shifts, particularly for this kind of shade. You can sometimes see things looking a bit dimmer towards the edges of the screen. 
and on TN models you get this sort of gradient vertically but things are much deeper further up the screen and much brighter, less saturated lower down. VA models they have shifts comparing the centre to the edges of the screen as well. This is just perfectly consistent for this kind of shade and that applies to most shades. I'm now on Battlefield 2042 and I'm going to talk about the colour reproduction of the monitor. Again, I'd like to point out that I'm, I realise this isn't a gaming monitor. Really, it's designed as a reference monitor and colour performance is absolutely a key part of this. And this is not going to be technical at all. It's just giving you a few examples and running through what you would see to the eye when you're playing games or just observing content. But if you need more technical details about things, then there's plenty of that in the colour reproduction section of the written view, so please do refer to that if you need to. So the monitor's colour gamut is very generous. It fully covers sRGB and extends a long way beyond that, pretty much fully covers DCI-P3 and Adobe RGB and also extends a bit beyond those areas as well. It's around 80% Rec 2020 that it covers, so definitely a wide gamut display. As such, when you're using the native gamut, as I am now, and as I do with my test settings, things look highly vibrant, they look very saturated, and again, as I mentioned with Legom, the overall consistency is excellent, so that means that the saturation is maintained very well indeed throughout the entire screen. So I'll just flash up the gamut on the screen so you can see what I'm talking about here. So when you're observing games under SDR and just most content when you're just browsing the internet or just casually using the computer, it's going to be designed with the sRGB colour space in mind. So when your gamut is wider than this, you do get this extra saturation, oversaturation. So things do not look as the developers intend here. It looks far more saturated. So there's a real punch to this red container there. The sandbags and the earth here, there's a definite red push. So it should be more of a neutral brown or slightly reddish brown in the case of the earth for this particular scene. The wood here as well, it's really a richer sort of bit of a red hue to it as well, much richer than it should. The vegetation as well, because there's lots of extension in the green region, has extra pop to it. You might say some of the vegetation looks a little bit neon. The yellowish greens are brought out too strongly and there's quite a lot of these bright looking greens that should be really quite a bit more muted than they look. There are some quite lush looking greens overall, but again, it's a look which some people are going to really like, but it's not as the developers intend, and the skies as well, because there's lots of extension in the cyan region of the gamut, really along the green to blue edge, which covers such shades. So that has extra pop as well. So if you like this look, great. If you don't, that's also fine. The monitor has plenty of options to get rid of this. So the various different emulation modes, you could emulate the DCI-P3 color gamut, with the DCI P3 mode. By default that has the P3 theatre colour temp setting which is quite odd if you're not used to it. So I'm going to switch this over to 6500K. What this will do for you then, it's not going to be very easy to see this in the video but it has toned things down somewhat compared to the standard mode which extends beyond DCI P3. In particular it has clamped things in the green region so it's quietened those shades down quite a bit. The cyans as well, the sky blue, for example, that's toned down a fair bit as well. But there's still lots of oversaturation. It's still a very wide gamut compared to sRGB. Adobe RGB mode, as you might guess, that's an Adobe RGB emulation setting. And if you're not familiar with emulation settings, it means that the color gamut is clamped to the desired color space. So I was showing you DCI P3 clamp before. This is an Adobe RGB clamp. And this maintains a really strong look to the greens and the cyans, whereas the reds are toned down a lot. So the earth actually looks quite neutral now. Again, it's slightly reddish brown, and this is really difficult to appreciate these differences in the video. So I'm just really talking you through this and showing and talking about what I can see or what you would see firsthand. Yeah, the reds are definitely toned down overall, but there's a lot of pop with these greens, quite a neon looking places, and again, the sky blues. Lots of pop there. Well, Rec 2020, I'm not going to go through because this doesn't have a Rec 2020 gamut. I talk a bit about this in the calibration section of the written review if you're interested. Rec 709 mode, so this is an sRGB emulation setting. There is also sRGB mode, but that's more restrictive. So with these modes I've been showing you, Adobe RGB, DCI-P3, and also Rec 709, you can adjust the brightness, you can also adjust the colour channels. And actually, you really have complete flexibility with this model because it has that included calibrator. You can use the calibration software to set it up exactly how you like. 
so it gives you full flexibility with these emulation settings. But even if you're not using hardware calibration, just to show you, with this Rec. 709 setting, you can just adjust everything. It's really good in that respect. Anyway, enough for wittering on. What does it look like? Well, it looks far more muted. And hopefully you can sort of appreciate this in the video a little bit, but to the eye, much less saturated overall. Really f very toned down look. And this is really more as the developers intend. Some people do like this look and it's faithful to the developer's intentions. I completely get that. Other people don't. And again, you have to respect that because in the real world, you see plenty of shades which are far beyond the sRGB color space. So if you were to visit a location like this in real life, things wouldn't look like this, even if this is how the developers intend. So it really just you know depends on how faithful you want to be to the original content. And as I say, I, I really respect both positions on this one. But just to summarise quickly, the colour performance of this monitor is very impressive. Its ability to cover the Adobe RGB colour space, DCI-P3 colour space really well, sRGB, the emulation settings, the flexibility you have with them, hardware calibration, it really is a powerhouse when it comes to colour reproduction. And of course, if you're not just gaming, you're not just consuming content, you're actually creating content that's really good as well. So excellent potential for work within all of those color spaces. You can definitely expect very good results for this one if you are a content creator. I'm back on Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I'm running the monitor under HDR. It supports a range of HDR settings. So this is HDR10 content which are referred to as PQ on the monitor. This follows VESA Display HDR True Black 400, not to be confused with the level without True Black. So this is focused more on contrast than it is on brightness. This is an OLED after all with self-emissive pixels. You don't have any local dimming to consider. The local dimming is at the pixel level, which is excellent, of course. I've got this hooked up to an RTX 3090 at the moment via DisplayPort, but I've tested with HDMI, I've tested with an AMD GPU via DisplayPort and HDMI, and it was very consistent between these GPUs and inputs. And what I'm talking about here, it really gives you an idea of the hardware capabilities of the monitor. You can expect a similar kind of experience if you're using an HDR compatible games console. If you're viewing other HDR content, I did look at a range of content on Netflix as well, and again, very similar. But like games, you know, some content has a better implementation of HDR than others, so it's not all created equal in that respect. But I'm definitely going to be able to talk about the limitations and the strengths of the HDR experience with this title. The monitor does support HLG, Hybrid Log Gamma. It also supports Dolby Vision, although my early Pre-release sample doesn't support Dolby Vision as it happens, but that will come with a later firmware update, which newer units will have already, and otherwise you'll be able to user update them yourself. So don't worry about that. It will be supporting Dolby Vision, this model. Also note there's user mode one and user mode two. If you use them, you seem to have loads of flexibility even under HDR in the OSD, but actually the reason they're there is for the hardware calibration. If you want to hardware calibrate HDR with your own sort of preferences, and that would include a peak brightness limit if you want to do that, then that's what the user mode one and two is for. If you just use it with the default profiles for user mode one and user mode two, it looks rubbish, don't bother. There are two relevant settings for HDR, two main settings for HDR10. There's HDR PQ Rec 2020. I'm, I'm sorry that you can't see this because of the exposure on the camera, but that's what it says. <laughs> HDR PQ Rec 2020. But there's another setting which is HDR PQ DCI. This will clamp the gamuts to DCI P3. And if you're creating content or you want to be very strict with that, then absolutely do that. If you have Rec 2020 selected, then it can use the full gamut of the monitor. Now, this isn't the same as if you're using different gamuts under SDR, because you're not talking about things created with the sRGB color space in mind and then using a much wider color space. Actually, a lot of content is designed either with Rec 2020 or DCI P3 in mind. But a lot of the time when I'm reviewing monitors, when you have them with HDR, you don't actually get a say in how it handles things. And usually what it does is what I'm making this monitor do. It will use as much of the gamut as it can, basically. A few other settings to quickly go through under HDR, which are relevant. If you select the mode, by default, it might have nothing selected here. But as I understand it, that selects PQ Optimize, which is the top option here. And actually by default, I think it's because I was messing with some things before. By default, I think this PQ Optimize has a little tick in it anyway. There's also PQ Clip, PQ Basic. These are all explored in the written review in the HDR section there, so please do refer to that. But PQ Optimized 
Rec 2020 setting, this is really the kind of setup which would mimic what most other monitors would go for in terms of HDR. So with this said, what about the performance? Well, again, that per pixel illumination is fantastic. So the bright crosshair there with a really dark background, there's no haloing, no blooming around that crosshair per pixel precision. So there is a an excellent range of closely matching dark shades. This one also supports true 10-bit color and that is actually used under HDR. If you're using HDMI, by the way, it still uses 10-bit color, but it's gonna be using dithering because it has HDMI 2.0 and it can't support the 10-bit color on the monitor itself. It'll be using GPU dithering. That does work very well, but if you want to be having everything done on the monitor itself, use DisplayPort and the array of these closely matching dark shades is excellent. It's very different to the kind of gamma enhancement you might get or be able to use under SDR because there's greater nuanced shade variety. Really nice in that respect, coupled with the per pixel illumination, excellent array of shade depths. The brighter content as well, it can display all of that with nice brightness, whilst the darker shades are nice and dark. It doesn't just look as it looks on the video, by the way. This looks like basically complete black, but it's not complete black at all. There's again that excellent variety of shades, but the bright area is much brighter. Now in terms of the capability, the brightness capability, that does depend on the level of brightness, the APL, the average picture level, and let's try that again. That depends on the APL, the average picture level. So that's really how much brightness is on the screen at the same time. But this monitor is actually very capable in that respect, especially for an OLED. So I'm going to show you a little graph on the screen. There are two lines to the graph because this monitor has a 250 nit setting, as they call it, which will limit the brightness. If you need to do that, then you can use that. But actually, you'll see with even that line, there are some discrepancies at the end of the graph for the 100% window, which is 100% white, or as I call it in the graph, 100% white patch. That means the entire screen is white. There is a drop off between the 49% and the 100%. Anyway, I'll show you the graph and then I'll talk about it a bit afterwards. So as you can see, for most of it, with the full brightness, it peaks above 500 nits, reasonably bright. It's not super bright, not for HDR. For example, the Dell Alienware AW3423DW QD OLED certainly had higher peak brightness than that, although it did use a more aggressive brightness limiter, so there'd be more of a fall off as brighter shades are introduced. With this one, it's actually quite consistent. Even for this scene here, yes, there's lots of brightness, but it isn't a 100% window. There's still some darker shades and medium shades as well. And actually, it doesn't dim a lot. It certainly doesn't dim as much as the minimum value that you saw on the graph. But this is really between a 49% white patch and 100% white patch at the moment, especially when I zoom in here. So there is a bit of dimming, but it's not obvious. I've actually measured this for similar scenes in game, and it tends to stick above 400 nits still. So yeah, it's pretty bright, but again, this isn't super bright by HDR standards, but it is pretty consistent. So there aren't obvious shifts as lots of bright shades are introduced. So in that respect, it's actually very nice. I like to mix things up a bit by talking about a few other scenes under HDR. Again, the per pixel illumination really helps here. This doesn't just look like a giant ball of light, by the way. It has a nice brightness to these lamps here. They're not super bright, again, by HDR standards. They don't have that kind of really impressive pop that some models have. Certainly, if you're considering highly effective mini LED solutions, which can peak well above a thousand nits even, nothing compared to that. But this still has a decent brightness, and certainly if you consider the contrast. And the 10-bit color reproduction, again, helps with this nuanced shade variety, which complements the per-pixel illumination very nicely indeed. So there are some really deep dark shades here, really atmospheric, really nice look to that, combined with these much brighter shades on the screen at the same time. So this is really an important part of HDR. It's not always just about supreme brightness. So this model delivers moderately high brightness, but exceptional contrast. So even for these little embers here, with the darker background, no unintended haloing or anything like that, perfect precision. So it really does deliver the kind of atmosphere that you'd hope for for scenes like this. And I don't know if this is intended, but there are actually tiny little patches of light. I don't know if you can see that. Surrounded by very, very dark shades up there. Even those little patches of light on mini LED solutions, even if they've got, let's say, a thousand dimming zones or a little bit above that, you would still see a distinct halo around it because this monitor essentially has 
over 8 million dimming zones, there's a huge difference there. It does make a difference. And I'm not saying that you're always going to notice haloing and, and it's not something that's always going to bother people on these LCD monitors, but it is definitely worth pointing out the precision here. It's exceptional. I'm now on Cyberpunk 2077. If you saw my video of the Dell Alienware QD OLED model, you'll see I used this scene here and I talked about the brightness limiter being quite aggressive with the peak HDR mode on that, so the sort of highest brightness level there for HDR. On this one, well, you don't get the same kind of brightness. So on the Alienware, for example, when I was just showing you a little bit of the daylight here, it really was bright, had an incredible bloom to it, not in a bad way, not an unintended bloom. It was just really kind of eye-catching in terms of its brightness. You don't get that here, but on the Alienware, when I introduced more of the scene, it dimmed a lot. Now, I'm not saying it dimmed a lot more than this is at the moment. It was just a comparison between there and there. It was really stark on the Alienware, and I also saw the dimming of the medium shades here, or the medium to light shades for the wall here with the ABL, because it doesn't just affect the light shades, it also affects darker shades and medium shades. So this is far more consistent. And speaking of consistency, I didn't really mention this before, but yes, there's a 250 nit setting. You can calibrate it to various different brightness targets if you prefer with the hardware calibration. There's also a uniform brightness setting. If you enable that under HDR, it actually will keep it around 250 nits all the time, which is quite weird because if you have the 250 nit setting active and you don't have uniform brightness on, then it will actually drop for a 100% window or for where there's a lot of very bright shades on the screen. Whereas if you've got uniform brightness on, it's gonna be around 250 nits all the time, even for a 100% white window. So it's a little bit strange in that respect. Just thought I'd mention that. But most people I'm sure are gonna be wanting to use the full capabilities as I'm showing you here. And even then, the level of consistency is really still very impressive. And the 10-bit color reproduction does help with the brighter shades as well. So weather effects, smoke effects, gradients, they're all much smoother with a greater nuanced shade variety. And I showed you the same scene at night with the Alienware as well, and I'd like to revisit this scene. And I talked about the brilliance of some of the bright shades in contrast with the darker surroundings here. Not as impressive on this monitor because of the more limited luminance, but still decent pop to it. I certainly wouldn't describe these shades as dim, but it doesn't have the same kind of pop. But the, the moon there, really nice and bright. You can actually see lots of detail on the moon as well. So there was really good bright highlight detail maintained here, even though the luminance isn't super high. And again, props to the per pixel illumination. So even if I look into the background, at those little traffic lights there, very small bright shades, surrounded by much darker shades, no haloing, no blooming, just perfect precision per pixel illumination there. And don't think I've forgotten the waterfall scene, so back to Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I do just feel for completeness I have to mention this particular scene. This is one I often say that I really like under HDR, and I do. It's just one I've observed on so many monitors under HDR. This one does really well here. Definitely the nuanced shade variety here, the smooth gradients definitely come into play. You can't see that on the video, I'm afraid, but to the eye, really nice. So you'll just have to take my word for it. Medium shades, dark shades, lovely array of them as well. Again, the bright shades, like the glint of light on the water. Pretty bright, pretty eye-catching. Not super bright, not super eye-catching. But overall representation of this scene, very nice. Back to the scene I showed you when I was talking about contrast. I was running it under SDR before, but remember I'm using HDR now. I'm going to level with you. I didn't actually mean to load this scene up when I was talking about contrast, but I went with it anyway. It was fine. Very smoothly done. So under HDR now, I'm going to really talk about colour reproduction under HDR, because that's another important aspect of HDR. The monitor's generous colour gamut is put to excellent use here. The developers are not targeting sRGB anymore. They're targeting extended colour spaces like DCI-P3 and ultimately REC 2020. This monitor does well there. I know it doesn't fully cover Rec 2020, so there's extra vibrancy potential for HDR content than what this delivers. But honestly, you're not going to look at things and think it looks anything but vibrant. It really does give excellent richness, excellent vibrancy, and it doesn't have a white OLED subpixel. It's not a W OLED design or WRGB OLED design. So that means it can maintain strong saturation at high brightness levels as well. So it doesn't dilute it in that respect. 
has an excellent colour volume. So I look at shades like this, bright gold, really nice, really impressive look to that. Again, not quite as impressive as I saw in the Dell Alienware, but that's not because of the colours, that's just purely because of the, the brightness, it's just not quite as bright. And I mean, I'm not doing a side-by-side -side comparison here, so maybe I'm misremembering, because this does still look very nice. But Laura's skin here, it's toned down compared to under SDR, it doesn't have that kind of red push. The pillars here as well, they're the intended red shade, they're not sort of an overdone red. And a lovely variety of greens as well, including some really nice deep lush greens, some more muted greens, and some really vibrant shades as you'd expect to see from a sort of jungle environment. So, very nice representation of shades toned down where the developers want them to be toned down and plenty of vibrancy where the developers want there to be vibrancy. And I know I talked about sky blues before, so let's just talk about them a little bit here. Really nice look to them, nice natural look to them. It doesn't look out of place or anything like that. It doesn't look underdone or washed out at all, and no, nor does it look overdone or cartoonish. So I really got very little to complain about in terms of colour reproduction under HDR. So yeah, really a very pleasing HDR performance from this one overall. Not the same brightness levels as some monitors, but actually not bad at all, particularly not for an OLED screen. And certainly in terms of the contrast experience and the colour reproduction, very impressive. I'm on Battlefield 5 and I'm going to talk about the responsiveness of the monitor. The game is running at 60 frames a second, you can see that in the top right, very small green number, you might not be able to see that properly, but it's a constant 60 frames a second, so I'm getting the most out of the monitor in terms of its responsiveness. It's a 60 hertz monitor, so that does mean you get a moderate amount of perceived blur due to eye movement. It also means that the connected feel isn't incredible, and that describes the fluidity and the precision when you're interacting with the game world. That is also affected by input lag, and on this model, of course, it's not a gaming monitor, so this isn't necessarily going to be an issue, depending on what you use the monitor for, or even for casual gaming. But I did measure an input lag of around 29 milliseconds. That indicates a high signal delay. That's the element of input lag you feel. So that is going to be bothersome for some. Should be all right for others. Coming back to the perceived blur, this is something which is explored in more detail in the written review and also an article linked to there all about monitor responsiveness. It's an important concept to understand, but the 60Hz refresh rate and the fact this is a sample and hold monitor, so it doesn't have a strobing backlight or anything like that, or it doesn't have a backlight at all, it doesn't have pixel strobing or anything like that, it, it means that there is going to be a fair bit of perceived blur, regardless of what the pixel responses are doing, just related to eye movement. But the pixel responses are excellent on this monitor. I'm going to show you some pursuit photographs. Again, this is a photography technique explored more in that article I mentioned. But many of you will be familiar with this, so I'm going to show you some pursuit photographs of this monitor compared to a few references. So basically this monitor just performs, well, flawlessly within the confines of its 60 hertz refresh rate. So the UFO itself, it does appear quite broad without sharp internal details, although some of the internal details are a bit sharper than you'll typically see on an LCD monitor at this refresh rate. And if you compare to the references, the first reference, the Acer XV282KKV, that has quite strong overshoot because it uses aggressive pixel overdrive to accelerate things, whereas the Gigabyte M32U, the second reference that was shown, that has some slight weaknesses to do with slower than optimal pixel responses, which gives a little bit of powdery trailing. But that's actually quite fast, um, that model, quite fast compared to, to be honest, many IPS LCDs and also compared to the vast, vast majority of VA LCDs. In the image, you might have even seen what looked like a little bit of overshoot with the PA32 DC, but I can assure you that isn't something you'll notice by eye. I certainly didn't notice it by eye in that specific test or just more broadly. So you're not going to notice sort of this strange eye catching overshoot or anything like that. You don't have powder trailing from slower than optimal pixel responses. You really get as much detail and the lowest levels of perceived blur you can expect within the confines of the 60 hertz refresh rate and the sampling method, the sample and hold nature of the display. I'm now on a different scene on Battlefield 5, just for completeness. I don't have any weird issues to report here. Sometimes here with LCD monitors, I'll be able to talk about some weaknesses which crop up because of these high contrast transitions. There are plenty of dark shades moving against medium to lighter shades. And, and generally LCD monitors will have at least some weaknesses here. This model, nothing of the sort, no overshoot to complain about, no slower than optimal pixel responses. But again, of course, the 60 hertz refresh rate, you do get a moderate amount of perceived blur. The connected feel is far from excellent on this monitor as well. For the intended purposes of this monitor, 
you know, you could argue that the 60 hertz refresh rate is fine, but either way, it would have been nice to see a high refresh rate because OLED technology really does lend itself well to high refresh rates. There's a lot of potential in that respect, a lot of untapped potential in this case. And the monitor doesn't support VRR, variable refresh rate technologies, doesn't have adaptive sync or anything like that. And there isn't a strobe backlight setting, or sorry, pixel strobe setting, I should really call it. To wrap up then, actually I'm going to change the wallpaper, I find that one a little bit distracting. Yeah, there we go. This monitor isn't going to win any beauty contests, externally at least, and it's not going for that. It's not a stylish monitor, it's not trying to be. It's a robust, solidly built monitor, good ergonomic flexibility. You get a choice of stands, the little mini stand is quite a useful addition as well if you favour portability. The internal colorimeter is certainly a useful addition, and that's all explored in a separate video, just in case you were wondering, as I haven't plugged that for, I don't know, at least 20 minutes. You can find a link to that in the description of the video. In terms of its contrast performance, excellent as you'd expect for OLED overall, but to get the most out of it, you do want to be using it in a dimly lit room. As your room becomes brighter, you get glare on the screen. The glare handling isn't particularly good on this model, even if you're using the included shading hood there certainly can be issues with that if the room's brighter. And there's also sort of a, a blue tint, which I noticed. Whereas in a darker room, you can appreciate the full advantages in terms of contrast. In terms of the colour performance, excellent consistency overall. There were some issues with brighter shades, such as white or very light greys. Also some purple shades in terms of there being a little bit of a sort of pink tint towards the edges of the screen, the side edges, related to viewing angles rather than uniformity. The uniformity, by the way, of my sample, that is explored in the written review, that was excellent, no problems there. For most shades, the colour consistency is exceptional, and the viewing angles as well, explored in the viewing angles video and a little bit in the written review, also excellent. Offers a very generous colour gamut as well, really nice coverage of the DCI-P3 colour space and Adobe RGB colour space, and of course the sRGB colour space, and it includes well calibrated presets with all of those colour spaces in mind and good flexibility there. And you can also hardware calibrate the monitor with the included colorimeter or your own colorimeter if it's a supported device there. The HDR performance of the monitor, I was very pleased with that overall actually. Yes, it's not the brightest, you know, some monitors certainly get brighter than this, even some OLED monitors like QD OLED, but this one was actually able to sustain pretty good luminance levels and it only really dropped off when there was a very high amount of bright shade on the screen. So it doesn't really give you the kind of fluctuations you might see on some models as the scenes change in a game or in a movie, so that's nice. Colour gamut can be put to really good use as well. 10-bit colour processing, in fact the monitor supports true 10-bit colour reproduction, so definitely a big tick in that box. And of course the exceptional contrast of the OLED, particularly if you're viewing in dimmer lighting conditions, really nice. And with the per pixel illumination, you don't have to worry about halos or blooming or anything like that. In terms of responsiveness, it's certainly hampered by its 60Hz refresh rate and high input lag. It's not gonna be sort of a dream OLED gaming monitor or anything like that, nor is it trying to be. And you could argue that a high refresh rate would have been nice even on the desktop. And there's no VRR support either, or a pixel strobing mode. But at least pixel responses are exceptional. There's nothing to worry about in that respect. So overall, this is a very capable monitor when it comes to colour performance, ticks a lot of boxes when it comes to its HDR performance and contrast, so the image quality overall, really good. It does lend itself well to not just content consumption, but also content creation. As I said, it won't be for everyone in terms of its limited refresh rate, its high input lag, that kind of thing. Now, something which I've managed to avoid mentioning so far is the price. Now, I'm not entirely sure exactly what the price is at the time of review, that information isn't available, but going by competing monitors, so there are some LG OLED monitors, and I'm thinking of the one without the internal calibrator, so that would be the 32EP950. They do have one with an internal calibrator as well. Based on that, I'd sort of put the price of this around there, or actually a bit more expensive than the LG model without a calibrator. So you're really going to be looking at 4,000 US dollars plus for this one. I know, I know, if I mentioned that before, some of you would have just turned off the video. I know some of you are just interested in the technology though and how it performs and what you might be able to look forward to in the future when this kind of technology gets filtered down into more affordable products. But if you do have the budget, if you're looking for this kind of monitor, I really do think this one ticks a lot of boxes. You know, it is a very capable reference display, really. So that's really all there is to the ASUS PA32DC. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. 
There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. Also be aware that liking the video and subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, a nice way of supporting us as well.